Uh, first, uh, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders, both past, present, and emerging. As I mentioned, I'm Smitty DeKorzik. I'm the Fleet Master Chief of the United States Pacific Fleet, and it's my honor uh, to be up here as we finish up uh, the last session of the day. And I don't think it's um, by mistake that a day that's been dedicated to sailors ends with a panel of esteemed junior sailors from our Royal Australian Navy. So uh, they are, I've talked to them, they're a little bit nervous. We've all been there, um, but they're rock stars and I'm sure they're going to be, uh, do just fine up here. Um, I say it's my honor um, to share this stage with them and that's not to be polite. We've talked today uh, numerous times about the resiliency and, and what our asymmetrical advantage is. And that's an asymmetrical advantage from every single one of our navies. And you need to look no further than Europe and the invasion of Ukraine. The most brilliant military minds and planners in the world cannot adjust a formula for the human resolve. Most would have thought that a country the size of Russia would have went in Ukraine and within 96 hours been done home and, uh, and, and on their way to their normal daily action. But they didn't account for the resolve of the Ukrainian people. Each one of our nations share that same. They didn't account for the grandmother standing in the second floor window of her apartment throwing Molotov cocktails on Russian tanks. The United States did the, had the same experience in September 2001. We talked about retention. We had absolutely no retention problems on September uh, or in October of 2001. In fact, I think they had to turn my grandmother away. Um, uh, so when I say that I'm honored to take part in this final panel, uh, with these great Australian sailors, uh, that is, the, it's an understatement and, and absolutely my privilege. Uh, we'll start off as, uh, as we've done in the past. I'll uh, introduce uh, uh, each sailor to come up. They'll give their testament or their presentation, and I'd ask that we hold all questions until the end. We'll cycle through the group, and at the end we'll have a question and answer period where I'll ask you to stand up, please, because as one of Steve's uh, demonstrated earlier, it's kind of difficult to see the audience, so if you can stand up, that will help me direct the microphone in your area. And uh, I hope for uh, uh, some great dialogue with these, uh, with these young patriots. So with that, uh, first I'd like to introduce A.B. Sandra Jefferson. Please come up and share. Thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Able Seaman Sandra Jefferson and I'm currently posted to HMAS Adelaide. I would now like to invite you to watch a short film presented by Captain Stuart Waters, the Commanding Officer, HMAS Adelaide. Once our people got onto the ground, they truly understood the full devastating effects of that tsunami into the communities. Uh, when you've got brick and concrete infrastructure, um, houses being completely destroyed, um, you know, cars moved into lakes, uh, all water tanks just completely destroyed and contaminated. You know, um, you can't really tell that from the air, but once you're on the ground and in the community, our people have really seen for themselves how difficult the situation is for these people. So during our period here uh, in Tonga, we've been able to achieve a lot of activities. Uh, and probably the most important of those has been the delivery of what's been termed the basic infrastructure recovery kits out into the outlying islands in the archipelago. Those um, burks, as they're known, are made up of reconstruction stores, primarily building and construction stores, as well as water tanks and water pipes and guttering for roofing, etc. And they're designed to get out into those islands and allow um, some of that basic infrastructure to be built uh, as, as a major part of the recovery effort following some of the devastation uh, after the tsunami. Within our joint task group though, um, we have had uh, additional forces coming from the Republic of Fiji military forces as well as the French armed forces of New Caledonia. Um, they've integrated really, really well into our little task group and um, have consistently played an important part in all the operations that we've conducted here in Tonga. We feel uh, very proud uh, seeing that uh, Tonga is our nearest neighbor and given this opportunity to come and help them during the trying times is uh, quite an honor for us. Yes, it's very, uh, it's a great uh, cooperation with uh, Australia and Fiji Army. It's a good, it's a good opportunity for the soldier French uh, to, to see 
uh, to uh, have a relationship with Australia and the Tonga Army. Uh, the Australian Defence Force and Australia has proven over and over again that we will always, always come to the aid of our regional partners and particularly our Pacific family um, during any humanitarian assistance or disaster relief situation. On behalf of the ADF contingent working alongside our Pacific family counterparts, I'd like to tell you that we are extremely proud of being given the opportunity to assist you during these challenging times. And I hope that what we've been able to achieve goes some way to improving the lives of those most impacted by the devastating effects of the volcanic eruption and the subsequent tsunami. Thank you. I would now like to share my personal story about my experiences whilst deployed on Optonga Assist. At the age of 51, I felt that I needed and yearned for some adventure and some additional challenges in my life. So I decided that I would enlist in the Royal Australian Navy. So fully supported by my family, in May 2019, I set off to HMAS Cerberus Recruit School. I graduated recruit school in July and graduated category training as a maritime personnel operator in October 2019. I then commenced my first two year shore posting at HMAS Coonawarra in Darwin. Two years later, in January 2022, I left my family in Darwin to commence my first sea posting on board HMAS Adelaide. On the 15th of January 22, an underwater volcano, which was situated 30 nautical miles to the north of Tonga's main island, had erupted. This then triggered a tsunami an ash cloud which caused significant flooding and damage to housing, infrastructure, communications and the fresh water supply was affected. The Government of Tonga requested assistance from the international community which included Australia and New Zealand. So on the 17th of January 2022, I embarked on board HMAS Adelaide. I must say I was a tad nervous and a little apprehensive. My initial thoughts were, wow, this ship is huge. So we sailed from Sydney that afternoon and arrived in Brisbane. We're an amphibious beach team, a boat platoon, a survey team, and headquarters staff embarked along with three Chinooks from 5 Aviation Regiment to supplement our one MRH-90 from 808 Squadron. I was amazed by the teamwork and camaraderie on board HMAS Adelaide, which I felt set the scene for a successful mission. I was on the light vehicle deck looking at the humanitarian aid containers and pallets thinking how lucky I was to be involved such in, in this operation and just to be able to assist in the recovery efforts. A number of engineering challenges did arise during the deployment. However, all crew members worked tirelessly and efficiently and the issue was rectified within 48 hours. To see the ability of all members of ship's company and embark forces fight to fix the issues, showed me how well the team were working to achieve the mission. HMAS Adelaide then arrived alongside Vuna Wharf in Nukalofa on the 26th of January 2022. Due to a number of COVID, um, sorry, excuse me, due to a number of positive COVID-19 cases on board, strict protocols were implemented, the wearing of masks and good hand hygiene seemed to be working. Weekly planned COVID testing took place and isolation compartments were very effective during the deployment. As Tonga was COVID free, humanitarian and medical supplies, engineering equipment and distribution of Australian relief was delivered in a COVID safe and contactless manner. I was lucky enough to visit one of the islands, visit the island of Pagamotu, which is a 30 minute boat trip from Nukalofa to assist with the clean-up and recovery. All the residents of the island had been evacuated as the spread of COVID-19 was imperative to avoid. So we boarded the LLC, which is a landing craft, before sunrise and made our way to the island, transferring from the LLC onto the Zodiac where we were delivered to the beach. We then made our way 600 metres down the shoreline to the clean-up site. There stood a home devastated by the tsunami. The interior of the house was totally covered in sand and all the furniture and personal effects had been washed away or destroyed. 
I could not imagine the force of the tsunami as it swept through this house. But there I noticed on the wall hanging were two family portraits. But the power of the spirituality within this house kept these portraits in perfect alignment. They were untouched, just as though the tsunami had never been there. I could feel the love and tranquility within this home. And this is a home which has made a family very happy. So our working party separated into three groups. One to clear up the sand within the home, one to recover all the personal items, the household furniture and household goods. Another team was outside recovering items that were strewn around the surrounding property. This house is someone's home and these belongings are someone's loved items. All the working party members were very respectful of these treasured personal valuables. As the temperature during the day reached mid to high 30s, the working party worked together as a team in a selfless manner. Army ration packs for lunch and snacks were enjoyed by all. So I found myself feeling very emotional as I managed my, imagined myself relaxing on the tranquil patio, gazing out onto the beach and then having the warning of a tsunami, being forced to evacuate my home, not having any time to collect my personal items and not knowing what I would return home to. So after this home was cleaned, we could actually see the tiles on the floor, but I had tears in my eyes just looking at the massive transformation of this home, we made a significant difference to someone's life. So then we trekked back down the beach to the next clean-up site, which included the Catholic White Cross Monument and more disaster-affected homes. And there were clothes still pegged on the clotheslines and it just appeared as if no one had ever left the village. We walked to a home that had once stood all that remained was a ceramic shower bay buried within the sand. Another home had an aluminium dinghy and a double bed mattress ended up in one of the rooms. The exterior walls had been totally torn off by the severe force of the tsunami. There right in front of me stood a ceramic toilet which had been totally torn away from the sewage pipes of one home and relocated outside someone else's home. The aftermath of this disaster was hard to comprehend and it made me realise how lucky I have been in my life to never have to experience such a terrible natural disaster. What a privilege it has been to make a difference to someone's life and restore parts of their home and cherished belongings. So after a long day, the team transferred from the island onto the Zodiacs, boarded the LLC and then a short ride back to HMAS Adelaide for some well-earned showers and dinner. Over the 52 days, 328 tonnes of humanitarian assistance and construction supplies were delivered to the Tongan Islands. Sales of 11,013 soft drinks, 5,822 chocolate bars, 2,000 bags of chips, 1,819 bags of lollies, HMAS Adelaide then departed Tonga and returned to Australia on Wednesday the 9th of March 22. What an experience for my second deployment and I can't wait until I do the next one. I look back at what I knew in January and I look back at what I know now. I look back at the opportunity given to me, how we made a difference to someone's life. I'd like to thank you all for listening to my story. Sandra, thank you for sharing that and thank you for your service. Next, continue with some humanitarian uh, and disaster relief operations. I'd like to ask uh, A.B. Freya Pounder and Jack Whitmore to the mic, please. Good afternoon. I'm Abel Seaman CSO Freya Pounder, and today with Abel Seaman BM Jack Whitmore, we'll be discussing the actions of Flood Assist 2022. We'll be examining the timeline of events and personnel movement, as well as deliberating on the lessons learnt within the experience. The call for personnel to assist in flood relief started with a phone call on 4th of March to Commander Upton, Captain of HMAS Jules, requesting available numbers. 
75 out of 164 members of ship's company were placed on 24 hours notice to move. Till the designated members of ship's company were finally given a set date a week later. This is after personnel were pulled off essential courses and recalled back from leave. Personnel from HMAS Chules and additional units departed HMAS Cuttable on the 12th of March with the objective to assist, to assist civil communities and the local populations with flood assist. In total, 741 ADF members arrived at Singleton Barracks, with the following week consisting of being separated into task groups, receiving our issued kit, which included a demonstration of how to set up and use a hoochie tent, while combating COVID-19 within the task force and having our first exposure to flood damage. As shown in the bottom photograph, where 17 personnel, including myself, were tasked to a local caravan facility in flood cleanup. For being my first exposure to flood damage, it was quite confronting to see families that have been through multiple floods throughout the years completely restart their lives with such high spirits after we spent the day throwing away their personal items and demolishing parts of their homes, which were beyond repair. There was an expectation at this point that all personnel would be fitted with the appropriate kit. However, this was not the case with certain groups leaving without suitable PPE and basic necessities due to the breakdown in the supply chain. Departure from Singleton Barracks took place from the 17th through the 19th, with groups being sent to Coffs Harbour for an overnight stay and then being dispatched into the Northern Rivers area of operation. The accommodation within Coffs Harbour encompassed stretches in community halls, with catering being provided by the local reserve unit. Within each task group, there was a transport element that played a vital role in personnel movement and the removal of debris. These inclu included Bushmasters PMVs, which are armoured vehicles built to carry troops, 40 mic trucks, which were utilised for the removal of debris, and a fleet of four-wheel drive vehicles. 521 ADF personnel arrived at Casino Showground on the 20th of March, where they integrated, integrated into the already established army camp and set up the additional tents to house personnel, with the army units providing guidance to the Navy on how to set up the tents. At the time of arrival, the weather had cleared up and the ground was somewhat dry. However, the casino camp was already starting to show signs of erosion from bushmasters and the 40 mark trucks using the roads. This was soon to worsen due to the weather taking a turn for the worse and rendering the camp unsafe due to flooding. This was also hampered due to the tents provided not being fit for purpose. For example, the holes in the roof and water ingress. Pallets were placed on the ground to raise personnel and equipment out of the mud. As seen in the top left photo, you can see a tent city, which was fondly nicknamed. The road running through the middle of the photo is already flooded and at one point the ruts in the road from the trucks were at my knees. On top of the tents you can see hoochies placed on the roof in an attempt to further waterproof. The 21st of March to the 6th of April, taskings in the casino AO include clean up and removal of debris from, from properties and assisting SES with sandbagging. Some personnel were tasked to go to the local community relief centre and aid in the delivery of essential items to flood affected families. Although at the time the work felt rewarding, the work routine soon changed, with the demand for work being more for machinery than personnel. Over time, people found themselves being left without any tasks to help the community. ADF, the ADF participated in the Richmond Valley Council Parade, which thanked the ADF for assistance in flood relief within the Casino AO. This was particularly rewarding to the large number of community members showing their support and gratitude. With the power and camps being very limited, Personnel sought to find other means of camaraderie, which then resulted in the Joint Service Sports Day for a bit of healthy competition between the services. There was also multiple games of touch footy between Army and Navy. This helped to grow and strengthen inter-service relationships. Meanwhile, 220 ADF personnel arrived at Tweed Heads on the 19th of March, with Army tents already in place. Similar to Casino, the ADF within the Tweed Heads AO participated with decontaminating playgrounds, relocating debris to open up waterways, assisting the Army in loading and unloading 40 mic trucks, supporting the Army in the movement of abandoned cars, and working on residential properties. On the weekend of the 28th of March, Tweed Heads and Casino experienced heavy rainfall of up to 275 mils within 24 hours. This posed a huge problem for the camp as the 10 facilities were unfit. On the same weekend, both task groups had been informed that the 28th would be a, a potential departure date. However, this was not the case. This would be one, in fact, two occasions we were told we were going home. Following from the heavy rainfall, personnel from Tweed Heads had to evacuate the area and move to higher grounds, with additional accommodation being organised 24 hours later. To help manage personnel in the ongoing COVID-19 battle, the Tweed Head task group then got separated into three different locations. On the 4th of April, minutes after being told that we were going home for the second time, a notice came through that we were to be retasked to the Bellina AO. 
On the 5th of April, we had packed up from the Tweed Head Holiday Park and we were on a bus heading to Bellina for an unknown time frame. Fortunately, within 15 hours, we had received another notice that the Tweed Head Task Force was being sent home on the 6th, with the Casino Task Force arriving home the following day. From both the Casino and Tweed Head Task Forces, there was a few lessons to be learnt from the experience. Both the accommodation at Casino and Tweed Heads were inadequate for living conditions, as the majority of personnel were flooded out of their established areas. Although we couldn't control the weather, having more equipment issued to assist in waterproofing the camp uh, facilities would have helped with the management of the accommodation. As you can see in the photograph, the water had spread throughout the entire camp, rendering it unsafe. A requirement for a greater awareness of wildlife as personnel were subject to bites and encounters by snakes and spiders. To help with this, personnel could have received a hazard report on the potential fauna and fauna within the area that could cause harm and how to treat it. And although the divisional systems that were in place worked as an effective manner of organising personnel, there was an overpopulation of required members within the AO. The catering for the Casino Task Force was provided by a Royal Australian Air Force unit located within Lismore, which was delivered daily by trucks. The catering unit was flooded in by the heavy rain, causing the Casino Task Force to live off ration packs for multiple days. The Casino Task Group conducted weekly rapid tests for COVID-19, and those personnel who tested positive were then isolated away and correct procedure followed. However, within Tweed Heads, it wasn't until positive case numbers started to rise that protocols were then put in place. And finally, the allocation of required work needed to be vetted more. As some jobs the ADF members attended didn't involve any flood damage cleanup at all. This became more and more of an issue as the operation continued. For example, people were using the system to get rid of trade waste from renovations. This led to a drop in morale as the troops felt that the people who needed assistance were not receiving it. From a junior sailor's perspective, our focal points of this operation was the knee-jerk reaction for the overcommitment of personnel within the AO. This resulted with members spending days at a time not being tasked with any work. However, throughout the operation, I was able to meet so many amazing, hard-working sailors that I have formed friendships with that will remain with me throughout my career. The breakdown in the supply chain, which slowed the deployment of members into the AO, was disheartening, as we felt we were waiting around more than assisting the communities. The chance to help us Aussies on Australian soil was an extremely heartwarming and an opportunity I will never forget. While Flight Assist was a rewarding experience, it did show a lot of flaws within the ADF's defence assistance to civil community. Noting the increased frequency and severity of natural disasters, it would be advantageous to further streamline the readying and deployment process for ADF personnel and assets. Thank you. Brian, Jack, thank you. I think uh, all three of these sailors, if I'm not, uh, if I'm, if I'm correct, all three have less than three years of service. Uh, and I can tell you, I bet if you said you were going to do humanitarian operations, that was probably not the first thing on their list of what they thought they were going to be doing for their Navy. Um, but it just goes to show you whether you're providing humanitarian efforts for your own countrymen and women, which I, uh, I, I find that difficult to do as you're sitting there looking at your, you know, your family in the face. But to do it for those around you, it just goes to show you that the compassion of the, of the, of the human transcends the, shoulder, or the uh, flags that we wear on our shoulders. So thank all three of you for your service. I appreciate that. Uh, next, I'd like to invite um, A.B. Zach Muller and Hannah Reavers to discuss autonomous systems. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Abel Seaman Zach Muller and my colleague Abel Seaman Hannah Reavers. We're here this afternoon to present autonomous systems and give our personal perspective in the transition period from traditional MCM to autonomous systems. Hannah and I are both autonomous underwater vehicle operators at Mine Warfare Team 16 over at Waterhen. We've both operated traditional MCM equipment of Mine Hunter Coastals and Sweeping and now sit at the forefront of this new and emerging technology within mine warfare. The strategic knowledge in this room far outweighs our experience, but hopefully we can give a little insight to the technology and let you know that we are on the right path. So the scope, before diving into new capability and looking at the future of the fleet, we need to understand why it is a requirement. So this afternoon, I'll briefly cover traditional MCM, the Australian Mine Warfare Team 16, 
the role of autonomous systems. Hannah will then cover the impact on personnel, the limitations and future operations. And we'll finish with a short video of our pre-workup training last week. So traditional MCM. For the REN, traditional MCM is broken into two categories, the hunting and sweeping. Mine sweeping is the action of towing mag magnetic dyads through a minefield to actuate EO, or towing a mechanical apparatus to cut the lines of moored mines. Our four mine hunter coastals have played a full service role when it comes to MCM, with both positive and negative outcomes. An MHC with a worked up crew, a full complement and serviceable equipment can locate, classify, identify and dispose of a contact in under an hour, which in the MCM world is a very short amount of time. However, to do so, the ship needs to be inside a minefield or within close proximity to EO. With a crew of 35 to 40 people, traditional MCM is putting more members in danger than is required. Australian Mine Warfare Team 16 is at the forefront of new equipment being acquired. The RAN has adopted an approach similar to the United States Navy and other allied nations. The term Mine Warfare Toolbox is one that best describes this approach, with multiple different tools to attack MCM situations. Currently, the Mine Warfare team has received delivery of the Bluefin 9 and Bluefin 12 autonomous underwater vehicles, as well as three mine countermeasure support boats. This has given the team the ability to deploy and carry out Mine Warfare missions in multiple environments and work with minimum numbers. To launch and recover an AUV from the MCM support boat, it can be done with a minimum of three people and no more than six on board, streamlining this standard approach to mine warfare operations. The MCM support boat is used to support autonomous systems. It is a 38-foot Sebercraft with twin inboard engines. It has been designed to house a bolt-on, bolt-off system to support AUV EMNS and clandestine swimmer delivery system operations. The MCM support boat can hold two Bluefin 9 with the ability to run concurrent missions or rigged for one Bluefin 12. This vessel is mastered by a leading seaman or above. The Bluefin 9 and 12. Both our Bluefin vehicles are very similar in schematics as seen. The biggest differences are size and endurance. With 24 hours battery life, the Bluefin 12 gives us the ability to conduct operations in hostile territories or areas that are hard to get to in a boat, such as rough sea states, and transit the vehicle to and from a safe start point. Bluefin data. The first image here is of the Bluefin sonar collected during post-mission analysis. From our experience, Bluefin has a clear sonar picture 80 to 100 metres on either side of the AUV's track. The second image is of the onboard camera. Good imagery below the surface can be difficult at times. Depending on a range of variables. To achieve visual confirmation sometimes means pushing the AUVs at altitude limits. Data can be transferred in multiple ways, either by Wi-Fi transfer, removing the RDSM, or a direct plug to the AUV. This can be done on board the MCM support boat, ashore, in a PMA workshop, or while the vehicle is on the surface of the water. So our EMNS system. That is the expendable mine neutralization system. There are three different variations of this vehicle. The Seafox C, which is a combat vehicle that holds a shape charge for mine neutralization. A Seafox I, an inspection vehicle for identification of a target. And a Seafox T, a training vehicle. The EMNS is designed to reduce mission time and target both bottom and midwater contacts, providing another tool for us to use in conjunction with our other systems. The impact personnel. During this transition period, sailors have seen a huge amount of extra responsibility, which we have welcomed. As a junior sailor, we have been the first to undertake the courses required. It has positioned leading seamen and able seamen at the front of this change. A leading seaman can become a master of an MCM support boat and have an AB as their mission controller running the AV operations. These operations can be often hours away from the task group or command, allowing our junior sailors to operate independently 
while ensuring C2 flows up the chain. For the mine warfare branch, it has also been a cultural change. A small community that has done things a certain way for a very long time. It is now experiencing a complete overhaul. This has created a positive cultural shift within the branch. It is allowing junior sailors to have increased involvement and assume further responsibility than has been done in the past. Limitations. As anyone who has experienced new technology within the workplace will know, it also arrives with a lot of teething issues. During our t and &E phase, a number of limitations have been raised that I'll touch on. The autonomous systems seem to heat up quite quickly while they are out of the water, conducting our pre-dive checks and the like. To operate in a, any weather hotter than Jervis Bay has depended on some crafty solutions by our sailors. Also, the AVs can be unpredictable at times. A clandestine mission could quickly be brought unstuck if a five metre long yellow AUV with a strobe light on top was to surface in a hostile area of operation. Future operations. With all that aside, our future operations will look more like the Ausmine Warfare Team 16's deployable MCM capability and less like traditional MCM. Small teams available at short notice to deploy by sea, air travel or road to conduct operations from any platform. Minimising risk to large crews and giving our junior ranks the responsibility to implement the capability that they've been training for. All right, we'll just now put on our short video. In conclusion, the requirement for this technology stems from outdated equipment and practices. To really understand the need for the advanced mine warfare capability, we would need more than 10 minutes and probably a security classification for this brief. The future of the fleet looks like minimising members in the minefield where possible. That will be done by employing autonomous systems, learning from our industry partners and deploying this technology in multiple environments. It is empowering our people, all ranks, to operate this technology and having a solid deployable MCM capability with the support infrastructure in place. We've learned a lot from Project C1778, which hopefully is improved during Project 1905. Thank you. Thank you. It really is amazing uh, as we get around to see uh, how our navies are using autonomous and unmanned vehicles. I had the privilege a couple years ago as a uh, command, command master chief on an aircraft carrier, 
And they said, hey, we're going to bring this uh, unmanned aircraft out and do test uh, launch and recoveries. And I'm expecting, you know, like a remote control airplane. No, this thing literally was just, you know, maybe a couple thousand pounds shy of an F-18 Super Hornet. And there's one individual with a, with a toolbox, you know, with a couple remote controls like an Xbox, you know, wheeling this thing around the flight deck. And I'm like, there's no way this is going to turn out good for anybody. Um, <laughs> But uh, they did, and it just goes to show you that you know, some of the best and brightest of our navies are in unmanned and autonomous um, you know, warfare and counter warfare, and uh, it really is a unique field. If you haven't got down to one of your commands that, uh, that are in this uh, career field, please do so. Uh, you'll be amazed at some of the stuff that we're doing around the globe, so thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to invite Senior Seaman Thomas Hart. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Leading Seaman Thomas Hart, and today I'll be giving a brief presentation on the REN's current maritime UAS and their parent squadron, 822X Squadron, which I am currently employed as a UAS maintainer. This presentation will feature an overview of the squadron and its purpose, the Royal Australian Navy's UAS roles, current air vehicles, and payloads and also a short clip of the squadron's recent embarked operations on Talisman Sabre 21. Following operating as an experimental unit for a number of years, 822X Squadron commissioned in 2018. Its purpose, to operationally test and evaluate military maritime UAS ashore and embark to better inform Navy for future maritime UAS acquisition and sustainment. The unit currently has approximately 50 positions and is set for rapid growth in personnel and UAS assets over the next eight years. From the earlier stages, maintenance and flying of the current UAS were carried out by aircraft technicians, CSOs and AVN sailors. The introduction of the remote pilot warfare officer category in 2020 has seen a slow transition to those members operating the UAS with the existing sailor operators being phased out over time. The squadron currently operates two types of military UAS for test and evaluation, the in-situ Scan Eagle fixed wing and the Shebel S100 rotary wing. Flight operations are predominantly carried out from Jervis Bay and on HMAS ships, with the squadron being based at HMAS Albatross in Nara. Earlier in May, it was reported that the Minister of Defence had approved the purchase of multiple S100 UAVs for the future REN use under the future UAS project C129. This procurement means that the S100 will be the UAS utilised on many of the RAN ships coming into the future. Incidentally, a larger version of the Scan Eagle UAS, the Integrator, has been selected by the Army for future UAS operations. Uh, these are the stats on the RAN's S2 S100 UAS, which has been operated on RAN ships locally and internationally on deployments. The S100 is used by many defence forces and civilian agencies globally with over 30,000 flight hours achieved across its variants. The five plus hour endurance and payload weight allowance are the key performance features of this platform. In general, maritime military UAS provide an air asset or complement an existing air asset on ships to provide enhanced over the horizon surveillance and detection capabilities via a suite of sensors. The RAN UAS has the ability to perform a range of roles including maritime interdiction operations, straight and sea lane transit surveillance, range clearances, covert intelligence gathering, naval surface fire support, humanitarian assistance and search and rescue. Uh, payloads used by H22X to conduct the roles required include optical and electrical infrared cameras, hyperspectral cameras, visual radar, and communication relays. Future payloads could include magnetic anomaly detectors, air traffic proximity avoidance, maritime radar, and electrical support measures. And also LIDAR. Uh, this is an example of the EOIR capability. The IR photo was taken from an S100 with a WESCAM MX-10 from approx approximately 45 nautical miles. The same camera in EO mode took this photo at approximately 13 nautical miles. Uh, 
Uh, following video shows S1 operations on FFH HMS Ballarat. Uh, the UAS integrated with the ship and embarked with and the embarked MH60R Seahawk Romeo flight to conduct exercises and later regional presence and deployments. The UAS was action via the ship's PWO with real-time payload feeds available in the ops room and the ops room sensor feeds available in the ground station. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. The Eagle scan, that's what I was talking about. I was expecting just a small little tiny model and I ended up with the, with the S100 on steroids. So, yeah, so thank you, Thomas. Uh, next up, I would like to ask uh, Petty Officer Kia White to talk Sailor Ma uh, Navy Mastery. Before I begin, I'd just like to thank my uh, fellow panel members. I know you were all nervous before you uh, got up here today, um, but well done and thank you for sharing your experiences. Before I start, I'd like I have a short three minute video uh, to introduce the concepts of Navy Mastery. The nature of maritime warfare is changing. No longer is it simply about having the most technologically advanced systems and platforms. It's about the people, the warfighters themselves, those with more knowledge, skills and experience who can apply that information intuitively will have the upper hand. Today's warfighter is contending with rapid advances in technology, deep fakes, advanced machine learning, AI and autonomous systems, and an increasing threat of state actors testing international rules. Aircraft for the north. We need to adapt. The key is Navy mastery. Knowing our domain and how it's changing is critical. Not long ago, an image like this would have been classified top secret. It shows a Chinese submarine entering a subterranean base at Hainan Island in the South China Sea. Now it's on planet.com for everyone to see. But merely having the images is not enough. We need to translate raw data into a meaningful input in our decision-making processes. Maritime mastery connects the dots to enable Navy to prevail in the future fight. A sailor who has mastered their technical competency can identify new ways to regain the upper hand. The 2020 hacking of US IT firm SolarWinds, a trusted provider to organizations across the world. Without needing direct access to SolarWinds customers, hackers secretly injected malicious code into the company's software. It was added to a routine update and rolled out to its 18,000 customers including Microsoft and the US Department of Defense. There's no reason to think that a similar attack couldn't happen here, with malware unwittingly delivered to every ship in the fleet. How would you counter an attack like this? Would we even know that our systems were degraded? And who would or could deal with a scenario like this? Your technical mastery will ensure you have the skills to intuitively identify and solve the challenges you will confront. You will fight and win at sea. Navy's strength lies in its people and its teams. To predict what enemies will think, preempt what they will do, and ultimately prevail in a prolonged fight, we need to break down our silo thinking. Imagine. One of our ships, prevented from entering a foreign port on a routine resupply stop because of a fake document claiming it was riddled with a contagious virus. It has a Navy crest, downloaded from the internet. The style and layout are straight out of the defense writing manual accessed online. Ship supplies are threatened, capability is compromised, and there's little hope of rest and recovery. What would you do how do you make sure your team can function? How do you manage the frustrations and emotions on board? Social mastery is about knowing the people around you, their strengths and weaknesses, and how to keep focused on the challenge ahead. No matter your rank, qualification, background, or your experience, we are one Navy, and we need to think and act as one. We need to shape our strategic environment 
to deter actions that go against our interests and to respond with credible military force when we need to. Navy Mastery is the framework that underpins our training and development, performance reporting, and how we identify and foster our talent. Warfare Mastery will enable you to become the modern integrated warfighter Australia needs you to be. So within Navy Mastery, it consists of three elements, maritime, technical and social. Within those three elements, there are four stages, foundation, intermediate, advanced and mastery. So when you're at the foundation level, you're delivering that capability. So for those CSOs in the room, that's when you finish your IOT course, walk out of HMAS Watson and join your first warship. When you're at the intermediate level, you're a narrow subject matter expert. So that's when you your sonar controller or your tracksuit. And if you haven't noticed already, I'm a CSO, so there's gonna be a lot of references. For those other work groups in the room, I apologize. So at the advanced level, you're a deep subject matter expert. So within the future Navy capability, that will be our ASW directors, or currently known as our ops room supervisors, or sharpening trying to grasp for PWOs. At the master level, you're the subject matter expert enabler and the evolver. So you're ensuring those below you at the foundation, intermediate and advanced level are becoming those narrow subject matter experts and also those deep SMEs. So within those four stages of foundation, we also have competencies. So the maritime and social, for all those other work groups, they're, they're the same. They're exactly the same for every work group. So that's regardless of your logistics, within the warfighting community, or within engineering. So it's our technical competencies that will change and will be work group dependent. So what does Navy Mastery aims to do? So it creates a clear and flexible pathways to, de to develop our people with an equal focus on maritime, social and technical. It's to drive individual development and modernise our training delivery. So for more information on social mastery, you can visit our website or come to us at our store at 2 Lima 28 on the main exhibit floor. But today I'm here to emphasise the importance of social mastery. But why social mastery? So our technical pathways for all our work groups are laid out. So we all know that we have to go to IT, so upon service, go to ITs, then go to C, then go on intermediate, do some short postings in between. We all know that. Maritime. Well, we're in the Navy, so we've got to go to C. So that one's, I think, um, pretty... Assumptions can be made here that we're in the Navy, so we have to go to sea. But how do we develop and why do we need to develop our social mastery? So for the first 10 years, I never chose or had a desire to do a posting that did not involve ASW. This is why social mastery excites me. It challenges me. It allows me to focus on my personal growth, enabling me to create an environment where people can strive towards excellence, establishing high-functioning individuals and teams, willing and able to fight and win at sea. However, there was nothing laid out on how to develop my social mastery. No pathways to follow, no courses that I needed to complete, nothing to establish a starting point. This is when I realised if I wanted to develop and enhance my social mastery skills, I would have to do it myself. This is what led me to the Navy Women's Mentoring Program and the Directorate of Navy Culture. My t participation within the Navy Women's Mentoring Program hasn't been a huge commitment. It's one hour a fortnight where I can focus and develop myself. So for those CSOs in the room, they're probably going, why is Kia working at the Director of Navy Culture? There is definitely no submarines on level two of Defence Force Plaza. And I'm sure those people who I work with are sick of hearing about ASW. 
So DNC is the first posting where I haven't focused on my technical skills. Although I still find time to continue to develop and maintain my technical skills. Emphasising the importance that all three elements are equally important. So social, maritime and technical. The Director of Navy Culture has provided me the opportunity to prioritise my social mastery and continue to develop my leadership journey. It has provided me with additional resources and networks to de develop my social mastery. But why is social mastery important to me? Our most lethal capability is our people. It doesn't matter how sophisticated our combat systems are or how fast our ships can go. None of that matters without our people. As Chief of Navy, Vice Admiral Noonan stated to my directorate, I cannot send ships to sea virtually. Well, not yet. We need people to crew our ships, and the only way that can happen is if we start investing in social mastery. I want to leave a legacy behind where our people have an environment enriched with shared values, enabling one another to be the best version of themselves and to contribute to the greater team as a thinking Navy, a fighting Navy and an Australian Navy. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So in the, uh, just for, for time's sake, I'm going to open it up just for a Q&A here for our panelists. I'll save my comments till the end. Um, what I'd like to do is I mentioned at the beginning, if, uh, if you could help me <laughs> by standing, if you have a question, we can get the mic over to you. It's very difficult to see from up here. And please uh, uh, let us know who you're directing your questions to. So who's up first? First one's always the, always the hardest. I've got some trig up here written down that we can go with, but that's probably not going to be much fun either. Juan's coming up. She must have one. Um, uh, firstly, thank you to the panel. Um, you exceeded all my expectations and I'm, I'm really honoured to serve in the same Navy as you. Um, my question, I suppose, would be for each of the um, panellists, how do you think social mastery will help you in the first... Pe people all talked about doing our job technically and in the domain. How do you think social mastery will help in those regards? <laughs> you might be able to help, help them. Yeah, might be able to help them initially. Uh, so as a bosun's mate, well, I spend a lot of my time on the bridge with ship. Uh, four in the morning, it's, it's pretty lonely up there. There's not much conversation going on up there. But if you have mastered your social skills, you can read the room a bit, especially when it's pretty full on. It gets full on up there when we're up top playing with all the other navies, getting close to other ships. It gets pretty full on. You've got to read the room, know the vibe, when you can kind of crack that joke to... Ease it back down a bit. You were all stuck to the console or to the helm for me. I'm white knuckling it. Crack a joke. We can back down a bit. Get back to our role. Keep um, yeah. <laughs> keep remember that we we are people at the end of the day. We are not robots. We have to have people on the ships to go to sea and fight and win. So to be able to master the social aspect and able to actually have conversations, read the room, talk to people, know when someone's having that rough day, something's going on that really aids in the capability of a ship if a, a crew is a family, really. So, yeah. Awesome answer. Thank you. Hi. Um, I work in the ship's office on HMAS Adelaide and I think it's very important to have social mastery skills to be able to understand, understand people. It's all about listening. It's all about being understand human emotion, um, showing a bit of empathy as well. And without understanding and being able to listen to what people want, you can't deliver on the other end. So to me, it's very important uh, to, to be able to listen and to be able to express yourself, just knowing that you can help people, having those social skills to talk to people, having the confidence that you can do it. Yeah, great. And I'm conscious of time and there's another question up there. Thanks, panellists. I really appreciate it. Uh, hello, it's Chief Zoe Mack. Um, I have a question for those that were involved with both Op Tonga Assist and Op Flood Assist. Um, so how do you think being involved with those, especially at the start of your career, will uh, what impact does that have on your sense of purpose within the service? Um, and how do you think that will influence your career going forward? 
Um, coming from joining the ship and going straight to a warship, I wasn't exposed to any of the hater or amphibious side of things. Um, and it was definitely a change to what I'm used to, but it was rewarding in the fact that I know that that's what I signed up for for the end of the day and I was able to help Australians. And I think it was also good to allow people, like especially gap years that got to experience flood assist, um, and say that this is the Navy. It's not the Navy every day, but it is part of what you're signing up for and it was the reality of what we do as our jobs every day. It kind of reminds you that our job is such a wide spectrum. From one point I can be doing some ropes or doing a bit of PT to the next minute I am standing in mud moving a fridge because someone's, someone's house is covered in mud like it uh makes you realize that yeah we we signed up to serve our country and there are multiple facets of serving it there's going up top playing at impact doing all that but there is also back home helping the people that we are serving to get back on track and live their life how we all want to live life Uh, it's just about the uh, women's mentoring program. What's involved with that? Uh, so for start with, so we have they do a call out for expression of interest, and you send you do up a a mini profile, I would say, and then they sit there and find you based off the information that you provide them. They find you someone suitable um, for that. If you were got into your mentor program and had that first conversation and you weren't comfortable or you weren't, you didn't, um, I guess, don't agree with the suitability, um, there is the option to obviously um, change change that out and um, opt to get someone else as well. Um, so one, one, once it's all set up, I just uh, communicate with, the, with my mentor directly and then so I have no uh, ties with the Navy women's, um, program after that. It's just something that I organise within my own time. Sometimes it may be within work time. But they set it up and then essentially after that um, it's all up to the mentor and the mentee. Fun fact, men can do it too. We're good? Okay. Okay, so, uh, so in clear, I'll tell you, I've intentionally stayed a little bit quiet. Anybody who's been around me for an amount of time knows that that's normally not my attitude, but um, you know, we, we talked, and my esteemed colleagues, we, I think when senior um, uh, enlisted and officers talk, we often talk about retention and things like that because we have expiration dates. And for, you know, me and, and some here in the front row, those expiration dates are coming close. So we start to look back on, you know, our careers and, hey, what, what, what could we have done to make our, our Navy better? When I get around for my U.S. fleet and I talk, I talk about, you know, developing a, a, a more physical and mentally tough sailor. I talk about technical expertise, and I talk about tapping into the innovation and creativity of our young sailors. And I'm always, um, it's refreshing that when I leave the room, I walk out going, hey, I know that my United States Navy is going to be in good hands. And I will tell you, uh, by these sailors up on the stage today, I know my Australian Navy knows that your Navy is in good hands too. Um, we talk about retention because Again, our most asymmetrical weapon system is our sailors. We need to make sure that we're taking care of them day and night. No problem that they bring us to fix is too small. No problem they bring us is too small because that's the number one problem affecting their life in that day. And if we can fix that problem so they can focus back on the war fighting and the expertise that we need them to bring to our navies, our navies are better, our collective partnerships are better, and in turn, our globe will be safer and better. So please, a round of applause for these, these great patriots. And Juan, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to moderate this panel. Thank you. All right. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate your help. And, I'm just, and I've just got a small gift for the team. Um, um, are very brave today. Um, I know in 2019 I presented at Sea Power and how nervous I was, and I don't think I would have been able to do it at that such junior level of time in the Navy. So thank you for your bravery, um, and thank you for your work.
For those that know, my background was logistics and apparently I can't count anymore. <laughs> Is Springy still in the room? Did I pass the fit test? Is that all I need to do at my age? We've talked a lot about age today. Um, hey team, that brings us to the end of the day. Look, I'm really delighted. Um, the people that held on, particularly the, my front row, I'd like to, um, they're, they're front row forwards in their Navy to use the terminology and I'd re really like to thank you for supporting me today. I'm honoured to have such strong colleagues and I think it was interesting how we've all got the same shared problem. So if you could just join me, we'll, we'll clap at the end so we're not doing it. The other one is I'd like to thank the Tear Charlie cohort that, um, and particularly Cheryl, I think she needs a flak jacket and she went down to the floor earlier. She was trying to buy one but they wouldn't let her have one. So um, anyone that wants to help her out, absolutely. Um, it's a tough job um, and thank you to the Tear Charlies for the support that you give me every day. And um, I need to call out one person individually, and that's Peter Teller Roach. Get up here. Yeah. We, we talk leadership and social mastery. I don't think you're supposed to say to your PO, get up here, but anyway. Um, <laughs> But no, seriously, what I do every day is enabled by this, this amazing young human. Um, we call Team One in my office. We, we joke that Team One's out, Team One's in, um, but it's absolutely a team. Um, for, the young, for the junior sailors and the, and the senior sailors in the audience, um, you know, a classic example of all the senior Warren officers like, what are we going to call this thing? You know, what do we give it? What name? And we're coming up with these crazy names. He goes, just call it what it is, ma'am. It's a sailors forum. So thank you for pulling it together uh, and that's, the, that's, that's exactly to reflect on um, that leadership and teamship and you know he mentors me all the time um, so I'd like to thank him. But lastly and most importantly I'd like to thank you for being here um, and those that will watch this virtually online later, thank you for watching online. What we're, it, the, we're trying to do a lot of stuff in the Navy, um, we're doing amazing things, this is the future of our Navy and what we need to do is support that legacy. So please. It's all about our people um, and thank you to everyone for being here. Now, as an advert, the Australian Federation Guard um, and our very own band will be doing a ceremonial sunset at 16.30. I know it's a bit wet outside, but if you could, could um, get out there and support the team. Um, they were training in the rain before when I ducked outside to take a phone call. Um, it's a tough gig. Um, and the other thing I know, um, there's soft drinks and other things that might not be soft drinks down on the show floor. Um, you've all earned something that's not a soft drink, but take whatever you want. Um, I'll be having a glass of wine in my hand in about five minutes' time. So thanks for your support. See you, team.